Hi, property people. Thanks for joining us today. As always, we will be sharing ideas, experiences, problems, and solutions for property people like you. Our interviews will get you to know some of the most active professionals in the industry that have achieved some pretty impressive stuff. Hearing about their successes, failures, strategies, and insights, we really hope you enjoy. Hi, everybody. Today, we've been speaking to William Stokes, really nice guy, um, working on some co-working spaces uh, in regional towns, cities across the UK, and really has a nice approach to the way he does things. He uses the word design-led, which is something that I appreciate a lot um, when people put that design uh, element into everything that they do. I think you just create a better product in the end. Um, so yeah, hope you enjoy. He shares a lot of insights. And if you're getting into that space, he's definitely one to follow um, and see what he's up to. So as always, please do like, subscribe, comment, share. Uh, the more traction we get on this, the more places we go together. Hope you enjoy. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Property People. Today, I'm joined with Mr. William Stokes, as per his Instagram handle. Um, William is a joint founder and CEO of CoSpace, a flexible workspace operator uh, focused on helping entrepreneurs and growing SMEs to connect, collaborate and succeed, as well as an occasional property developer and occasional speaker. Thank you for joining us today, William. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Good, good, good. Well, I thought it'd be a good idea for you to um, have a discussion with us and share some of your insights into the world of co-working. Um, co-working and co-living uh, have all you know, become quite a popular um, buzzwords um, over the last few years. And especially since last March, there's been, you know, people moving out of office space and in busy um, inner city um, units. And you've been kind of championing co-working space uh, in a really cool way, I must ad admit, because there are other people doing it. Not that many. It's still I think there's still quite relatively few players, uh, but you've been doing it in a very cool way. But before we go all into the detail where I always like to start. Who were you at school? Did you always want to be in property when you were growing oh, up? Wow. Um, no, definitely not. Um, I was probably as far away from where I am now. I was, uh, I was awful at school um, and I was awful at my attending school. I had um, middle of the range grades. Um, I was never really anybody that stood out, if that makes sense. Um, and I certainly had no idea what I wanted to do with my life and uh, for those that know me, my background prior to getting into property was engineering. So I worked in the oil and gas sector um, and I was kind of pushed down that route a little bit by, by uh, some family members. And um, that, that kind of led me towards a path that then led me into all of this. But I was certainly not um, anything like I am now at school. So what, what um, in terms of property, you know, Mark Stokes, as well as somebody that you're you're related to, who's done done a lot of property. You know, what what was the big pull on in, in property specifically? Yeah, so fun, funnily enough, it was actually Mark. Um, so uh, Mark, for, for those who know him, used to be board of directors at a company called Mighty, and um, I I met Mark properly when I was kind of in my early twenties. Um, we didn't really have a relationship up till then. You know, it was kind of a every five ten years. It, it was it was very sporadic. Uh, mainly because my parents separated there's a whole other story there but um so so I got kind of speaking with Mark and he kind of gave me some career advice he, he um gave me some really good career advice when I went for an interview with a company that led me into kind of my engineering career and he happened to have a development not far from where I lived in Lincoln and he called, called me up and said look do you want to come and check it out and I went and had a look and we ended up going for dinner after and he said look we need somebody that can project manage this project and a couple others are you interested and I kind of went home and thought about it and said yeah actually you know it's that kind of thing of opportunity um is there if you look for it and I said yeah do you know what actually yeah I'm going to go do this instead I'm going to take a step back from my engineering career I knew that I could go back if I needed to and I'm going to go and join this kind of startup that uh, my uncle had founded with a couple of his friends and you know see where that took me and um it, it took me on an incredible journey 
took me through, you know, we, we did some HMOs. We did kind of co-living that you touched on. We did six units across Grimsby and, and crew. Me and another guy, Dan, went and delivered that for the group. Um, we, we dabbled in a few other bits. And what we kept coming back to was we just wanted to do commercial development like the guys were doing. So they said, look, let, let's all just take the business in one big direction of commercial development, whether it be small or large units. And that's exactly what we kind of focused on and went out and did. And, you know, me, me and Dan, the we kind of went off and did these HMOs together and then came back to the group and eventually said, look, let, let's go just completely do this. And alongside doing that, I realized that a, we were taking some really nice office buildings that would make really good office buildings and not just apartments. Um, but B, I kind of fell in love with this whole co-working model and realized that I wanted to a do something in that sector, but B, I wanted to do something that was my own, something that was me. Um, I think with family businesses, it tends to go one way or, or two ways one of two ways you end up either being you know completely lazy and, and relying on the fact that it's family or you end up working twice as hard and I went to the latter and just kind of worked my ass off really and um, realized one day that I wanted to go and work just as hard but doing this instead. So the co what was it about co-working that really caught your attention because you mentioned crew you mentioned these other places where I assume you were doing kind of um, almost co was it like HMOs and and yes uh, correct so yeah, these are yeah. high income generating assets, um, targeted residential, where you're renting everything out by the room. And then you thought, you know what, we can do this, but in a more of a commercial uh, yeah. uh, kind of environment. Well, I, mean, I, were, I mean, I, I chat to people now that are getting HMOs, right? And people say to me, should I buy HMOs or should I develop them? And the answer to me is always develop them. Um, you know, if I just give you a prime example, the first one that we bought was 70,000. We spent about 42 to 45 on it and Cambridge and Counties revalued it at 185. So that is what led us to go and do six. And this was in the days of 2016 when valuations were going a little bit crazy. Um, you know, those, those days are gone and, and those properties we were buying for 70 grand are now, you know, 90, 95 grand. So the deals no longer stack in the same way, um, but it certainly gave us a really good opportunity to go and develop those. And it, it I, I, I was commuting down to London and, and working from a flex space down there. And what me and my business partner, Alistair, realized was that nobody was really doing the design-led, um, mm. really nice professional space that we'd seen in London. No one was doing it outside of London. If you went into somewhere like Doncaster or where I'm from uh, in Lincoln, your main thing was Regis. And we got to the conclusion that most people hate, your face says it all, that most people hate <laughs> Regis. Um, and that there was an opportunity to go and do something a little bit different and to do it. We call it kind of boutique on a budget, which is create a really nice design led high end product, but do it on a budget. So it's affordable for people. Don't do it. So it's, you know, 800 quid a desk and it's, and it's unattainable. Um, so that's kind of what led me into realizing there was an opportunity in co-working. And it, it, when I look back now, I can see the steps, but it all snowballed. Like I didn't know what the steps were going to be. I just knew that I had an outcome that I needed to get to. And every day I just kept taking the steps forward. And when I look back, it's kind of got us to where we needed to. And I couldn't have traced that journey. And so if we fast forward, we're going to jump around like a Pulp Fiction film here. But if you great fast forward, <laughs> great film. If you fast forward to now, you've got projects outside of London. So where are they peppered around? Yeah, so I'm, I'm sat in Reading right now. Um, so we've got a space in Reading that we launched uh, back end of last year. We closed it during Christmas and that kind of period because of COVID and we reopened it um, not long ago. So I'm, I'm sat here. We've got a site that we're on, um, on. We've got a project that we're on site with in Stevenage, which is a really nice project. Um, to put it into context, this one's about 14,500 square foot. And Stevenage is 16,000. I turned an 8,000 square foot building into 20 apartments. So that kind of puts it into context for the resi developers out there. Um, so they're, they're incredible projects. We've just, we're just signing heads of terms and going into legals on a site that is towards the West. So towards kind of greater West London, I would say, a little bit further than Reading, which is a really interesting scheme. And there's a couple others in the pipeline. So our target is to end the end of 2022 with at least eight sites. And over the period getting to kind of 23, 24, we want to get to 20 sites. Very, very interesting. That's serious growth. And in a time where since last March 2020, um, everyone 
everyone that I know, I think bar none, has told me that their company has agreed for them to work at least going into the future, if not entirely from home, uh, three days uh, a week or two days a week in the office um, and, you know, and working from home the rest. So in terms of how you feel this has impacted co-working space, um, because I, I I don't think we're fully out of this pandemic it's just yet although the, there seems to be light at the end of the tunnel um, yeah. you know do you do you foresee that this um, co-working space trend which was definitely moving you know in a, in a very positive way before the pandemic it was definitely a huge thing I mean we work was incredibly popular um, which we'll talk about in a bit um, do you think that the pandemic has uh, made it harder for for this model or or better or kind of indifferent um it, it's made it it's made you have to get lean and realize and totally understand the numbers i mean uh you mentioned we work which is a prime example which is you know was highly unprofitable we we have certain metrics that we have to hit you know when we look at how long the business has been going and we look at when we launched our first site the reason why was because we took time to understand okay well where do the margins need to be where do the numbers need to be where does the site need to be you know we we, we have it down to an exact specific size criteria all these different things what covid has done is it has accelerated the move towards flexible working businesses no longer want to sign five year or ten year leases even even the big corporates they're saying look we just want something for three years max maybe two years um we're seeing a big shift away from companies that wanted you know, a hundred person office are now saying I want 30 person office and I want to rotate. And we're also seeing a big uplift in memberships. So that's companies saying, I just want to buy 10 desks somewhere. I'm going to have 30 people that probably alternate and use them, but they can just drop in when needed. Um, and if you've got multiple spaces, then that's brilliant. So they're the big kind of things. Me and Ali sat down. So we have some, the reason we have managed to be success, as successful as we have to date is the fact that we have some incredible backers behind us who all sat there and said, your model is going to be in demand. Let's carry on because this is where the market is moving to. And without them, we would have been, you know, just kind of, we would have slowed down. We probably won't be as expanding in the way that we are. Um, so they've certainly helped. But the other thing is we, we know that we're in for a tough 12 months. Same as what you just said. I think 2021 is going to be a tough year. So we're fully prepared for that. But I know come the back end of this year, start 2022, those people that have spent, you know, close to two years at home are going to be fed up and they're going to be desperate to get back to some form of working for two, three days a week. And they certainly don't want to be facing 5 a.m. alarms and commutes into London on a busy tube. So this move away from that style of working to more flexible regional working is, is where we're exactly trying to position ourselves and where we think the market is going to move to. I couldn't agree with you more, to be honest. Before the pandemic, um, you know, I was following you closely and um, I, I definitely thought you were on to something quite cool, especially you mentioned the design-led aspect of it. You were really creating spaces that people want to be in. Um, and then when the pandemic's hit, I, I just think that people are going to, I mean, I know a number of companies already that are giving up their leases and are going into a, a co-working type space where, Half the team will be working from home Monday to Wednesday. Then the other half will come in Thursday, Friday, you know, Thursday, Friday. And, uh, and the business itself is dictating it rather than the people. The business is saying that I don't want to be forking out an overhead of such a big office for everybody to be in when we don't all need to be in. So we're going to cut our overhead and, and make our business a lot more lean and therefore a lot more startups as well, businesses that are growing, that are wanting to be able to cover some costs will be, you know, applying for this kind of flexible space, especially if it's in an area where they don't have to have such heavy, crazy rents at home as well. So they can live in a nice place. They can travel to a decent place to work. Um, and, and that's why I think, especially the fact that you guys are doing design, I, I think you're going to be um, pretty, pretty popular. Well, that, that's, um, that's very key. And, and, we, we, me and Alistair have to give credit where credit's due. We have an incredible design team that took what our vision was and created this. When me and Ali first sat down, we literally sat down at the end of the day and went, we have got 50 shades of grey. Like we went, everything was a different variance of grey and it was very grey, the space. And we were like, we need to bring in someone that has the expertise and can do what we need them to do. So they came in and did that, which was amazing. The second thing is, We've tried to make it very aspirational. So when you're when you come here and you go to the kitchen, you look at the kitchen, you're like, oh, I wish I had this kitchen at home. 
And then suddenly it feels less like an office. It doesn't feel like a, a tea point with a boiling tap that scolds you every time you use it. And, and it moved away from that kind of conventional office. I think that's certainly the way that people want to move to. Um, and then the third point I was going to say is, as a, as a general rule, although you have a smaller space, we are cheaper on the overall basis compared to a traditional lease because we, we include everything, all costs, we include furniture, things like this. I'm not trying to sell the business again, apologies. But the, the number one thing is you don't pay for the space you don't use. If you need a meeting room, it's there and you use credits or you pay for it when you need it, but it doesn't sit vacant costing you money for you know 20 days of the month. So the benefit is you just you pay for what you use, and that's the way that people want to move towards. You know, I, I mean, I have no issue at all with you kind of highlighting the features and benefits because at the end of the day, um, HMOs have been around for a long time in the form of bed sits, and they were leaky, smelly, drafty, uh, forgotten places that you know now they're these funky, cool, trendy, um, popular HMOs with all the mod cons with a TV in your room, and it comes with this, that, and the other. And I think that you're right; the Regis model is is a little bit dated and. You know, people need to be investors, developers, people with a bit of vision like yourself need to be bringing the office space into the 21st century and creating the kind of design led. I mean, I'm a massive Apple person. So from everything that they do and and is all design led and it's got me addicted pretty much to every single product that they bring out. So um, including these AirPods, but I'm the same. I'm the same. <laughs> so, and, and I think you get with that um, loyalty and I think you get, with that um, uh, a form of a tribe uh, and a type of, I think there's a type of business that's coming out of this. Um, I mean, digital nomads are a thing as well already, you know, from the, from the tech industry. And I think you're gonna have, um, yeah, a, a lot of following from this. One of the questions that I've got though is <clears throat> outdoor space. In terms of outdoor space, is that something that you guys um, focus on having uh, because, especially since last March, at least for residential, uh, outdoor space is a big thing. Uh, what yeah. about office space? Because, you know, most people, don't, most people, the outdoor space for an office is where people go and have a cigarette these days. Yeah, so it's a very good, um, it's a very good question. In, in Stevenage, what we've got is we've got about four and a half thousand square foot terrace that has a pagoda on it. It has, you know, several seating options. And the idea is that's just free space to use. So, you know, if it's a sunny day and you want to go work out there, take your laptop, if you want to go and have a meeting, go and have it out there, have a coffee, sit down, do it. That's all included. We, we're we doing the same in Reading. We The whole time we did the Reading project, we had confirmation that the roof terrace, the roof was fine. We were going to put some extra units on it. Don't worry, everything's fine. The loading's fine. We said, okay, brilliant. You know, we'll, we'll sort that towards the back end of the project. Back end of the project came and we said, look, let's just get a structural survey. And the structural survey came back pretty negative. So we've got a it's kind of a fabricated timber structure that sits on the roof and then we can put our decking on and that enables us to do it structurally to the, to the right regs and so on. Um, the problem with that is we had to go through a process for that. So we've delayed that and we'll now do that in the summer. So we will so, have it in as well, but most of our spaces will have roof terrace space that's designed to have, you know, like a, a cabin out there in the summer so that if somebody wants to serve drinks in there, they can, but you can also go and work out there and, and it, makes it easy on that Friday afternoon when you look at it and go, do you know what? Am I going to go home at four and battle the traffic or should I stay here and have drinks with some of the guys in the team till six or something? Exactly. And I think that that element of uh, community, um, you know, is, is really important going forward as well. And, you know, some people have talked about creating hubs. So whether it be people in property or whether it be all solicitors from different parts of the legal in, uh, industry, all coming into one co-working space, um, but that sense of community, is there any efforts do you take um, to try to get everybody on a mailing list where you do, I don't know, like a cinema night or something, um, put the chairs out and do salsa night or something? What, you know, Do you make an effort to create the community out of your members? Yeah, yeah. So um, there's a couple of things to that. So, so A, community is absolutely key. It's at the heart of what we do. So having a design-led space is amazing. But if people don't know who's in the space, then there's no opportunity for, opportunity for collaboration and there's no benefit to the members. So when you, and I spoke about this a few times, when you look at the way we've designed it, we've, I read the Pixar book about Steve Jobs. And one thing he did was he put kitchens and toilets in one location so people had to walk to them and go past everybody. And we did that with the kitchens. You know, we put this amazing big kitchen, I'm looking out on it, hence why I keep looking to my right. Um, 
And the idea is no matter where you are in the building, you come to this point, you go to that coffee machine, you bump into someone else who's doing the same and you say, right. oh, what do you do? And you know who people are. The thing that Interesting. I hated about certain office spaces was you had no idea who was down the hallway, let alone on the floor above. You never saw them. So the idea is people come together. We, we use a, a, a members management system, which allows us to list benefits. And it acts kind of like a social media platform where we can post mm. out on there rather than spamming people's inboxes to say, we're going to do this event. Do you want to register? And they just go yes or no or, you know, whatever. Um, so for us, it's key about getting people together getting people understanding what everybody else does and what their weaknesses are, what people need and helping people to come into the space as a two person office and say, do you know what? The person in a six person is where I want to be in a year's time. And then they get there and then they get there and they grow up, they grow through the space. That's the whole idea. Very, very Uh, interesting. Community is key. You mentioned Apple and there's a, there's another really good example. And I, I absolutely love American express and it becomes like a community in this membership thing that Certainly for me, growing up was very aspirational. Like I, I couldn't wait until I got my first American Express. I remember doing like um, credit applications and getting rejected because I was never at that level. <laughs> um, and, you know, when I got one, uh, it was like the pinnacle for me because I got to where I wanted to get to. And, and you know, it's quite, um, it's quite vain to measure a certain level of success by that. But it's what it represented, which is the community, the, the global thing that it is. Um, and what we're trying to do with CoSpace is create this global community that's welcoming to everybody and say, look, what we want to do is help your business to thrive. Because if you thrive, you'll grow through the space, you'll stay longer, we'll get better retention, but not from a selfish point of view, but we just want to see you guys thrive. Interesting. One of the other questions that I had as well was regarding the environment that you create. Uh, is One person told me that they change the air conditioning at different times of the day to make the space. So for example, post lunch, you'd basically boost the air conditioning because normally everyone's kind of sleepy after you know, two, three o'clock. So if you boost the air conditioning, it kind of keeps everybody awake and they almost manipulate. I mean, I, I totally see the merits of doing it. I mean, and uh, and to be honest, you know, it's benefited me a few times working on the air conditioning in, a, in an office after food to get keep me going. Um, but is that something that you guys also pay attention to? Yeah, we do. We don't do it to that extreme. So there's a couple of things that we do. The first one is we pump three different smells throughout the space. So if you go into the toilet, there's a smell in the toilet. If you go into meeting rooms, there's a separate smell. And in the main space and the offices, there's another smell. And what what that does, when you walk into the toilet, you're met with this amazing smell. When you walk into the space, you're met with this really nice smell that it's the same smell that they use at Lululemon, believe it or not. So I don't know if you've been in the floor, it smells incredible and it draws you in. And that's what we've tried to replicate, which is, you know, we're trying to bring hospitality into office space. We're trying to put service back into serviced offices. That isn't my saying, but I think it's a brilliant one. Um, so that's key. The second thing we do is we mo- we monitor air quality. Like we, we constantly bring fresh air into the building. So we don't recycle air. We constantly bring fresh air in. That's the, the system nice. that we've got was expensive, but it's designed to do that. And we monitor things like CO2 levels. We monitor if there's three people in a six-person meeting room. We know we can drop the requirement for for what's needed. Equally, if there's a 10-person that's packed out, we can raise it. Where we're trying to get to is where we now start to monitor how many times the toilet door opens so we can start cleaning based on a requirement and not just that we go in there and clean every four hours. We can go, look, we need to clean in there every two hours on this day, but on Friday, it's fairly quiet, so we'll go in every six hours. Um, we're trying to get to that level. The the, the sun sensors on the HVAC are good because they they track things like air quality and CO2 levels. There was a study of a building in London where after lunch, everybody was feeling really sleepy and they put some sensors in and they found that they had four times the amount of carbon dioxide in the air that they should have had. And that's what was affecting it. So for us, it's about tracking to make sure we've got the perfect air quality for the well-being purposes, but also to make sure everybody's got what they need. And it, I wouldn't say it guilts them into being more productive, but it certainly puts them in the right, right mindset and the right frame of, of mental uh, well-being that they can perform at their best. Very, very cool. I think, you know, the level of detail that you guys have gone into to, to make a, um, a a very progressive type space um, is, 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 is incredibly cool, man. Um, in terms of the metrics, so 
if you're trying to calculate kind of looking at a space, you've got 15,000 square foot. So what one of the, what, you know, easy one for me that I always know about is like HMOs. Um, if you've got um, for every person, individual, you've got between, you've got to have roughly 20 to 25 square meters of space. So if you've got a hundred square meter space, you know that you can get a four bed HMO in there four people. And it's kind of luxurious. It's kind of spacious, or you can squeeze five people. You'll still, you know, it's comfortable enough, but it's going to be a bit more of a squeeze. It's going to be a bit more tight. Uh, no. I mean, per square foot, do you know how many people that you can get into a building at a maximum capacity? Yeah, top top level is um, very simple calcs. 15,000 square foot would be circa 150 to 180 people. Um, it's normally anywhere between 85 to 100 square foot per person. That's generally the rule in office space. You've got some office suites that are higher, some office suites that are lower, but as a general rule, that's where we sit. And that's where the kind of industry norm is outside of London. If you go into central, I mean, I had an office in central that was 45 square foot person allocation. So you're getting quite dense. But again, the benefit of using flex space is the fact that you, you only pay for what you use. So, you know, you might only have a thousand square foot floor plate and a 15,000 square foot unit, where if you went for traditional lease, you probably lease 3,000 3, square foot or maybe two and a half for whatever's available. Um, so that, that's the benefit. But it, it's roughly around 85 to 100 square foot a person. And so you you can get two different types. You get freelancers that come in on an individual basis, or you can get a company that says, you know, we're thirty people, but we need a space of fifteen because we're we're mixing the week up a little bit. Um, and in terms uh, for a for a freelancer, for example, what I mean, or what is the minimum? Do you do kind of minimum contracts? Do you do like one month, six months? Is it is there a minimum contract? That's three months. You can you can currently drop in by the day. So if you need it by the day, you can use it by the day. Interesting. We're putting in a system that allows you to use it by the hour. So what you oh. do is you have a card, you have a minimum spend of, I think it comes about £25 a month that you get billed anyway just for the back-end stuff. But you use that and you get billed at £4 an hour and you can tap in, tap out and use any space that's ours. That, that's better for when we grow. You know, when we've got 20 spaces, that will become much better product. Um, but currently you can do it by the day, you can do it by the month, by the week, whatever you need. If it's office space, we'll do it by the month or typical is kind of six months, 12 months or 24 months because there's price breaks on, on that commitment. But we can do it one month rolling, dedicated desks are one month rolling, hot desks can be weekly, monthly, you know, for three months, whatever's needed. So the idea is we're completely flexible with whatever members need. We didn't want to have multiple lines of products. So we just have a couple of products, yeah. but they, they kind of flex within those products. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. So yeah, you want to streamline it as much as possible, um, which actually brings us to what I wanted to touch on, which is the WeWork model, which I, depending on which perspective or which angle you're kind of looking at it, it was a massive success or a massive failure. Um, and you know, the, the right. owner, yeah, I mean, the owner walked away with a pretty good pay packet from it. Um, but it, it hasn't performed as a business. So, I mean, what's your take on that and what, what learnings have you taken from, from that business? Well, the first thing is every single question that I get asked by every single investor is how are you different from WeWork? Um, <laughs> my response is besides the fact that I wear a leather jacket, that's where the similarities stop. Um, <laughs> WeWork was really good because they came in and they put the sector on the map. Regis was there and they were doing their thing, but WeWork really exploded it. And what they did was they came in and they said, this is now the baseline for office space. If you want to compete with us, you've got to go above, which you've got some operators that have bright neon lights, really expensive fit out, or you've got to go below where you end up with a kind of budget but cheaper product. They put the center line into space. They did really well from that point. Now, when I've gone around their spaces, I've noticed things like they've got maybe too much breakout space. They've got these kind of beanbag areas and it's very intimidating if you're a 40 year old professional businessman that's got yeah. an agency, you know, six, seven people, it, it becomes quite intimidating. But certainly for, you know, people my age and younger millennials and, and Gen Z, it's perfect for them because it's exactly what they want. It's, it's interesting. I, I it's sad what's happened, um, but equally, they just went a little bit too crazy. I mean, you can't call yourself a tech company when you deal in real estate. You're fundamentally 
and you, you don't even own the assets, you're leasing the assets. So, you, you, you know, you're like an operations co, like a hotel, which is where the valuation went a bit crazy. The valuation hadn't gone as crazy as it had off. I think they had a pretty solid business model if they had figured out how to make it profitable and, and scale it back. Um, it's in the back of our minds all the time. Everything we do, we question, are we doing the right thing? Sometimes we've just got to make a decision and do it, but we sit back and we say, in the long term, is this going to benefit us? Do we still have a strong margin? And our aim is to grow off the back of our success and not just grow for the sake of growing. Yeah, that makes sense. And in terms of other players in the market, because I don't know that many people that are doing such huge spaces as what you're doing. I know that there's a lot of people that have um, taken maybe a retail space that's been a little bit um, derelict for a while because no one knows what to do with retail. And they've, you know, they've stuck six, seven desks in there and, uh, and it's on a high street. Um, but in terms, in terms of uh, like there, there are, there's nobody else that's coming close to WeWork. So, I mean, where is, where is your vision? You mentioned like eight, eight units in the next, what sort of time frame again? Yeah. So by the end of 2022, we want to have eight sites operational. Um, we've got another three sites in the pipeline Two, obviously Stevenage and, and, um, the other one in the, in the West will be delivered this year. We'll do another three or four next year, and that'll get us to a kind of the eight by the back end of next year. And then the idea is by 23, 24 to have 20 sites. And then at that stage, the, the plan was always get to 20 sites and then make a decision. Right. At that stage, we want to start buying sites. So actually owning 50% of all the sites that we are um, occupying in, in the kind of Bocco Opco style uh, format of doing it, similar to the way I guess McDonald's have done it. Um, that's the long-term strategy. But after we get to 20 sites, the goal for me is to take it into the US market because market trends that we're experiencing mm. here are everywhere. If you go to, I mean, my best friend lives in Cincinnati. And every time I go out there, they have the exact same office trends that we have here. Um, so the goal will be to get to you know, the US market and then grow to 100 sites. But in order to do that, we'll have to take on some private equity or you know, find a family office that can back us and help us really get to that stage. That's the long-term vision. The core vision at the minute is 20 sites. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because I was, yeah, was going to say you know, inter- international aspirations for stuff like this are... Uh, um, I felt relatively um, realistic, I think, because, uh, you know, we've got, there's a co-living space called The Collective. Um, yeah. Reza Aslam, yeah. So, you know, there's 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 definitely a room for the co-working equivalent where, you know, they're expanding into multiple different countries um, and, and, and doing and covering that space quite well. Uh, and for your expansion beyond that, so you, you're... You're not thinking of a big exit right now. You, you're really thinking expansion, grow as large as you can, go into the US and and possibly mainland Europe. I, you know, or Asia, kind of Far East Asia, Singapore, and these kind of places. Yeah, I mean, uh, when when I I try not to think about it because you can get bogged down in looking too far into the future. It's good to have a future plan, which is why the twenty sites and then the US and the hundred sites is is quite key. And it's almost kind of just attack what you've got in front of you. But when you look at it from a kind of ten x mindset. I would love to be sat here in 10, 15 years time with 600 sites across, you know, several countries around the the globe. That would be amazing. My business partner, Alistair, is a little bit older than me. And I think he will probably exit at some point in the next five to 10 years. I'll stay in longer than he is. But we both say the exact same thing, which is the minute we wake up and no longer love love what we're doing, that's the point where we'll exit. Um, And I don't, you know, we genuinely both love what we're doing. So I don't think that will happen anytime soon. But circumstances in life change and things along the way. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not far behind you in terms of I'm probably going to start having kids soon and things like this. So, <laughs> um, you know, circumstances will change. But for now, there's absolutely no plans to do that whatsoever. And do you work out of these spaces yourself or do you, do you work from home? Yeah, I work from home two days a week and I work from <laughs> one of the offices three days a week. That's generally my kind of mixed thing because... I like working from home on the days I go to the gym. It gives me a kind of good regime, but I like to come here sometimes and just spend, you know, the day here. But whenever I'm here, I tend to end up fighting fires, if that makes sense. Uh, <laughs> I have a strategic plan for the day and I end up losing three hours because I go off and do things or, you know, a member wants to have a meeting and they want some stuff and so on. So, yeah, it's quite interesting. So in, I, I, I'm thinking, you know, so you've got like, say, a 15,000 square foot space. You could 
technically sign up more people than can you can accommodate at any one time um yeah. isn't how do you manage that kind of risk because what you know what if you get a, a run on the on the space and everybody wants to use it at the same time do you, you get people i assume it doesn't happen but like is there anything that you can do to try and avoid that it's, it's a very good question. The reason it's a good question is because you operate your co-working similar to how you operate a gym, which is you might sell, I mean, a gym, you'll sell 3,000 memberships for 600 people, right? That's, that's their yeah. entire model. We, we sold capacity. We then said let's sell 50% above capacity and see where we get and play it by ear. Here, as a prime example, we've got about 3,000 square foot of breakout space that isn't sold in any way. So if I had, you know, a load of deskers turn up, there's all this overspill space. There's a kitchen island. There's all the tables around it, which probably have 20 seats. So the idea is we can utilize that space. Um, it'll be interesting to see, but we are trying to figure out what's the sweet spot of memberships for us to sell. If we've got 30 desks, do we sell 45? Do we sell 50? Where does it sit best? Um, and do we look at some form of booking system where we say to people, well, look, you can have this membership. It's slightly cheaper, but you have to just book the day before or a couple of days before if you want a desk. Um, and do it similar to how gyms do it with gym classes. I think that will be the way moving forward, just assessing where we're at. That's actually a good comparison compared to gyms because I'm thinking in terms of the marketing as well to bring people through the door. It's a relatively new concept, so you probably have to do a bunch of marketing. Um, do you use commercial agents as well uh, to bring people through the door? Yeah, we use commercial agents. We use brokers. There's a lot of brokers in, in the flex space sector. They charge you 10% of the first year's income, so fairly standard. We use our own marketing efforts on Facebook and Google, but the most effective strategy we've found is LinkedIn outreach at the minute. Interesting. And do you get, you you do a viewing, so they come around, you show them the space. Um, do you get a lot of tie kickers? I mean, what's the conversion? Do you get people coming, they're going, wow, this is amazing. And then like, is, is or, or are you finding that there's still a lot of people just feeling out the concept to begin with and seeing if they can really make it work in their mind? Is it is it in, a, in its infancy as a concept still? Yeah, it, it tends to be less tire kickers. What tends to happen is we get, it's an interesting cycle. We get someone that comes and they'll say, I love it. I want to come in. We're like, brilliant. Let's get you set up. What is it you're after? Is it a desk? Is it an office? You know, and so on. We get quite a few people that come in and go, it's too expensive compared to what I've just been offered around the corner, a well-known operator. So I'm going to stay there. And then six months later, they come to us and go, actually, the cost wasn't what they said it was because there was these other costs and it's still horrendous. Can we come and have another look? And, And we say, yeah, cool. So that tends to be the process. We don't, our price is our price because everything's included and you kind of have to be quite fixed with it. You know, we won't go, look, we'll do you a super, super deal, you know, just for you and so on. That, that's not our model. Our model is, look, this is the cost, but here's all the benefits that we add in. Um, that's the way we kind of focus. We're not the cheapest. We're not the most expensive. We're trying to sit middle of the range. Makes sense. And in terms of, I mean, we mentioned a little bit about, you know, the 40 year old guy um, who's perhaps a little bit intimidated by WeWork, but in terms of demographic that you're, you're going for, um, is there, is there an age range? Um, I mean, I'm assuming that the older generation who just like their office space and um, want their own kind of desk every single day, that kind of thing. Um, not that many other, or don't want to know who else is in the building. They'll kind of, I'm, I'm assuming that they'll want, the traditional style. And then as you mentioned, Gen Z, they'll go the other way. Um, I mean, is there a max age that you're finding that really kind of resonates with this? Uh, and It's interesting. It's a very interesting point. We set out to stay away from that millennial beanbag tech culture. That was our core thing. We were like, our focus is growing SMEs that are accountants, lawyers, solicitors, professional mm. creative agencies, things like that. And that's exactly who came through the door. I mean, you know, there's two offices that we've let to uh, a advertising agency. They do advertising. Their ages range from mid twenties up to mid forties. Um, the founders probably, I'd say, late thirties. Um, that's kind of their age range. There was a creative agency. You know, they 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 were looking at six person. Haven't committed yet, but hopefully they will. Um, and you know that their middle age range, I would say, is forties. Um, and exactly for that reason, they, they, they've been intimidated by other spaces. They just want a space where they can come and work, but it's got everything they need. If they need to come out and meet people, they can. If they need a good cup of coffee, they can. All these different things. We've tried to stick to growing SMEs. That's our core focus. 
you know, the business that started on the kitchen table five years ago, they're now at five, six, seven people. They don't know where they're going to be in 12 months time because they're going through this growth phase. They take a 10 person office. If they need to scale down to eight during that term, we'll work with them if one's available. We'll take that, we'll take that income cut because we know that if we move them down and sell the 10, we could probably find someone for the 10, but also when they go to an eight, they'll remember that and they'll stay with us and probably mm. move them to 12 next time. So that's kind of where our focus is, but it, it tends to be growing SMEs. Yeah, I think that that, that is a good but it tends to be growing SMEs. That that's a good space to be in. I think SMEs, they do need a lot of support. I think they're the backbone of the the country and you know, creating good spaces for them and encouraging them to to start up uh, in cost effective ways is uh, is incredibly important in in the grand scheme and the macro level. So we you mentioned also um things regarding marketing, socials, LinkedIn. Um what about things like TikTok and stuff? Do you, because I actually have noticed you've done it. One of the things I, I like about you, Will, is that you're quite refreshing um, and quite transparent and kind of happy go lucky about stuff um, and quite open as well. Because you've mentioned stuff about kind of uh, mental health and, uh, you know, on, on openly, which um, I think is really important because a lot of people need that support. And a lot of people think that when you're doing good things and you're successful, that, you know, life's so rosy for you. and they maybe not know what's going on in the background. So the fact that you can be a little bit open with that, do you find that that helps you? Um, and do you find that that helps uh, other people, you know, get become kind of warm to you? Yeah, I think it, um, I think it certainly resonates with more people. I mean, I, I, like you said, I've been very open on my Instagram and so on. Um, TikTok's an interesting one. So just to come back to that point. So um, my partner's sister, she's 19 she was using TikTok and she's like, it's so hard to grow all these things. I posted one video and it went viral straight away. And that was just sheer chance. That was sheer chance. And off the back of that, I ended up with thousands of followers and, you know, 100,000 views and things. Wow. And then about October time last year, we went through a period with business where we just needed to knuckle down. And I came to the conclusion that I was posting stuff on Instagram just for the sake of doing it. And my entire day, everything I did was on Instagram but it was only ever the good bits and nobody saw the, the hard bits or the tough bits or the bits where it was like a complete down day. And I had to drag myself out of that. And that, what I did was I just got rid of all my social media and deleted most of my accounts. Um, and I just, I just ghosted everything for four months. And, you know, the, the, my, my close friends all messaged me and said, look, we're here if you need anything and so on. And I just took time out to, to kind of reassess. And that's where I, when I came back, I was more open and I, I stopped I realized I didn't have to put on this facade anymore that then I can be open about the things I'm feeling and I can be open about the situation. Cause you know, you'll know it is very tough. You go through periods where you just flat out and suddenly it's eight weeks later and you just get burnt out and you need to take a few days to step back and reset and refresh and, and realize what it's for. What are you doing it for? It's not just this thing that you've just thrown the last kind of few years of your life at actually the long term is to get to here. And that's for everyone around you. And so on. Um, so I've been quite open, but my my social media, I get kind of DMs quite a bit and things like this. And I'm always responding to people saying, look, this is a situation. You know, there's a really good quote that me and my friends say, which is entrepreneurship is like getting punched in the face every morning. The punches don't <laughs> stop. Eventually, you just get used to them. Um, <laughs> and it, it's not it's not 100 percent true because it's certainly not like being punched a lot. But you know, that you've got to be willing to take those hits and you've got to understand that um, failure is not final and you can fail at one thing, but it doesn't mean that that sets the, the premise for everything else. You know, that we've had learnings and mistakes that we've made along the way, but we've picked ourselves up and said, okay, we won't do that again. We'll do things different moving forward and we'll just improve. Um, that's kind of where we're at. The, the attitude and that approach is really, really awesome. Uh, and I think lots of people, especially people that are starting out and and really trying to grow um, that hit hurdles along the way would, I think, benefit from. Um, which actually brings me on to uh, a kind of a final question, which I like to ask. And, to, you know, you, you are a, a property person, um, the way you think, the way you go about your uh, business, the way you're learning from, and, and uh, you know, people like Steve Jobs and what the, what he was doing um, at Pixar, etc. To be a property person, though, what what does it take? I mean, so you've just mentioned a quite a few things there, but if you were to sum it up as concise as possible, mm. I would say um, it's not it's not as passive as people think. That's the main thing. 
A lot of people get into it because they think it's going to be this thing away from whatever business they've got or whatever. It's a business in itself. It takes a lot of hard work. The rewards will be there, and they certainly are, but they take years to come to fruition. Um, you know, you've really, you've really got to, you've got to work hard at it. But I think, I think the biggest thing is don't get caught up by a lot of other people. You know, so your day one is not the same as somebody else's ten thousandth day. Um, just be prepared to to recognize that it does take a lot of hard work. You need to figure out that strategy that's going to work for you, and just go and go and build it and develop it and learn doing the process. Um, you know. The other biggest thing I would say is th the deals get bigger, but you still have the same amount on the line. I mean, I saw this firsthand when we were developing the apartments, which was, you know, we'd do 20, 30 apartments a year. Then the next year we'd do 60 or 70. But those 60 or 70, we were just as deep in as the other ones. You know, it was kind of everything on the line. If, if one deal went wrong, then we were kind of a bit, a bit panicked. But equally, it's all calculated risk. That's, that's the biggest thing I always say. You know, people say to me, you've got a lot of risk. And I say, well, not really. It's pretty much all calculated. And for yeah. everything that could go wrong, I've got at least two or three exit strategies. So if I, you know, prime example for this is if, if I couldn't fill this space, I know that I could go and let it for the exact same amount that the lease payments are, and that would cover it. And I just forget about it for five years or maybe revisit it then. I know that that's my exit. So I think it's calculating the risk, de-risking it as much as you can, recognizing that it is going to take a lot of hard work and making sure you get the right people around you. And that's not just power team in terms of who you've got in the team from architects, from you know whoever you've got, but that's also the right people in your family that are backing you as well. I'm very, very lucky. My partner, Jess, she's been with me since I was in my engineering career and she's followed this entire path. And she doesn't believe me, but I always say I would not be where I am without her. She's been the guidance and the moral support that I've needed. And she's kept me on point and kept me... Um, can't think of the term but she's kept me on the right path for definite surround yourself with the right people calculate risk um and keep smiling i think is uh, something that uh, yeah. you kind put of in uh, put in the work <laughs> if you want the returns you've got to put in the work there's no there's literally no simple way about it and it's one of those cliche things because i remember being younger when people would say if you want to be successful it takes hard work and i'd be like what does that actually mean like I'm working this corporate job. If I work even harder, I'm not really going to get much more successful. I might get a pay rise at the end of the year, but it's not going to be where I need it to be. Um, so what does that actually mean? Well, what it means is figure out that one thing that you want to do for the rest of your life. Wait, if I came to you and said, you can only do one thing for the rest of your life, but you're never going to get paid to do it. What's that one thing that you're passionate enough about that you would go and do and then go and do that? and figure out how to who in that space has monetized the hell out of it and do exactly what they did. Nothing that we do, even in our sector, is new. There's nothing brand new. Everything's been done before. we just got to figure out who did it and how can we do it better. That's like the uh, biggest bit of advice I kind of took on board. Well, Will, thank you ever so much for sharing that because you know what? I think that there's going to be more people wanting to do similar stuff that, that you're, you've done, whether it be resi HMO stuff or whether it be moving into the co-working space. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think you are pioneering a space to be honest. Um, so there's going to be people looking to you and, and, and asking how you did it. And I think all of that's uh, top advice. Thank you. No, thank you. It's really good. It's really good. You, um, you often forget, certain elements until you start talking about it and then you're like oh yeah we did that we did this so no it's really good thank you i really appreciate it well what what, what i would like to do is get you back on uh you know in a year or so of time see how things have moved because i imagine actually the last 12 months have been quite stressful especially when march hit you like, oh my god no everyone's from work from home <laughs> what, what am i gonna do um no. but you, you've kind of come full circle um, and everyone's going back to the office and I assume things are picking up for you so you, you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. 100%, yeah. And in a year's time, it'd be really good to do it in one of the spaces. So, um, you know, whether it's this one or whether it's a new one we've got in the West or whatever, it'd be really good to do it in a space. You know what? That would be great. If we could do it live, we'll bring cameras down and we can also do a little bit of a tour of the space. That would be awesome. Sounds really good. Sounds really good. Thank you very much. Have a great day, Will. You too. Cheers. Take care. Thanks for tuning in today. We've got lots more super active property people coming up. So keep up to date. Click the subscribe button. Hit the bell icon. Leave us a comment. 
share us and find us across social media. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.